Hello everyone and welcome to your partner in education, Agile Rank Mate. Today, in this episode of the future, we'll be looking at an important scientific breakthrough, one that may well change the future of the energy landscape. The greatest and most important source of energy on planet Earth is the Sun. According to an estimate, it produces more energy in two minutes than the whole annual energy use by humanity. It radiates energy in the form of electromagnetic waves and heat. While humans have successfully used solar power in the form of water boilers and photovoltaic cells for some time, the efficiency of this technology is still low compared to the mammoth levels of energy use. However, the mechanism that the sun uses in creating energy might be the answer. Nuclear fusion is a reaction in which two or more atomic nuclei are combined to form one or more different atomic nuclei and subatomic particles such as neutrons. It is one of the two forms of nuclear energy the other being nuclear fission. This process has a host of benefits. The fusion reactions don't release CO2 and only produces short-lived nuclear waste that can be reused within 100 years. If any disturbance occurs, such as a power outage, the reactions within the reactor shut down. The fuel used for this is hydrogen, which can be sourced from water. In today's world, we use nuclear fission, where atoms of heavy elements such as uranium are split by a slow-moving neutron to create smaller atoms, creating a massive energy release. But how does nuclear fusion or the joining of atoms also produce energy? The answer depends on the atom that is used for nuclear energy. Simply put, for elements lighter than iron with 26 protons, fusion releases energy and fission consumes energy. For elements that are heavier than iron, this is the other way around. Fusion uses very light elements such as, as fuel, such as hydrogen. You could, in theory, try to fuse any two elements. Less, which have a mass less than iron. But the general reaction to be used for electricity generation is 1P1N plus 1P2N giving us 2P3N which divides into 2P2N plus neutron plus energy. Where P stands for protons and N stands for neutrons. Now what are these elements that we've just talked about in terms of their proton and neutron numbers. Hydrogen is 1P0N because it has one proton and zero neutrons. 1P1N and 1P2N, the elements used for fusion here, are isotopes of hydrogen called deuterium and tritium respectively. Isotopes have the same amount of protons but different numbers of neutrons. As seen above, deuterium and tritium fuse, resulting in 2P3N, eventually splitting into 2P2N and a neutron. The reason being 2P3N is an unstable configuration. Now what is 2P2N? It is helium. Helium has two protons and two neutrons. And luckily, it is not dangerous. It's what we use to fill balloons. Now why does this release energy? As weird as it sounds, helium plus one neutron has less mass than deuterium plus tritium. By recombining the same number of protons and neutrons into a different configuration, the whole nucleus loses mass. And this lost mass is converted to energy, which is released in the form of heat and electromagnetic radiation. 
Einstein's famous equation E equals mc squared is at work here. We are converting mass into energy. So why aren't we using fusion to make energy? In the Sun, fusion occurs because of the intense pressure in the Sun's core caused by gravity. It gets as hot as 15 million degrees Celsius. The good news is we can create fusion on Earth. The bad news? It's really difficult. To date, all fusion reactors use more energy than they produce. This is of course a problem. A power plant that uses more power than it produces is useless. The ratio of input to output energy is often called Q. Nuclear fusion has a long history, but for the most part, we haven't managed to get the value of Q to 1, where input power is the same as output power. In order to create a viable fusion reactor to function, it needs to fulfill three requirements to turn deuterium and tritium into helium. 1. Make plasma. To get the nuclei of atoms to touch, we first need to break the atoms free from their electrons. This is done by heating the mixture to over 100 million degrees Celsius. The resulting free-floating electrons and nuclei form a plasma. Like solid, liquid and gas, plasma is just another state of matter. Number 2. Density. It describes how many particles are packed into a specific volume. In the case of fusion, we want to get lots of deuterium and tritium into a fusion reactor. Why do we need this? The higher the density, the more fusion reactions occur. Number 3. Containment. Where are we going to keep this extremely hot, high-pressurized plasma? We need a special container that can withstand these conditions for a relatively long time. The amount of time we are able to confine this energy has increased rapidly over recent years, from 30 seconds in 2013 to 101.2 seconds in 2017. Also, there are two broad goals in fusion research and engineering. Scientific success, where the reactors produce more energy than they require to run, and cheap energy, where costs are low enough and efficiencies high enough for energy to be sold cheaply. The first goal has been finally cracked in 2022. Scientists have confirmed that a major breakthrough has been made that could pave the way for abundant clean energy in the future after more than half a century of research into nuclear fusion. Researchers at the US National Ignition Facility, a vast complex at the Lawrence Livermore National Laboratory near San Jose in California, said fusion experiments had released more energy than was pumped in by the lab's enormous high-powered lasers, a landmark achievement known as ignition or energy gain. The value of Q, or ratio of input to output energy, has now been brought greater than or equal to 1. The facility was built to perform experiments that recreate briefly and in miniature the processes unleashed inside nuclear bombs, enabling the US to maintain its nuclear warheads without the need for nuclear tests. The experiments are also stepping stones towards clean fusion power. Dr. Arati Prabhakar, the policy director at the White House Office of Science and Technology said, Last week, they shot a bunch of lasers at a pellet of fuel and more energy was released from that fusion ignition than the energy of the lasers going in. This is such a tremendous example of what perseverance really can achieve. To achieve the reactions, researchers fired up to 192 giant lasers into a centimeter-long gold cylinder called a whole roll. The intense energy heats, the
the container to more than 3 million degrees Celsius, hotter than the surface of the sun, and bathes a peppercorn-sized fuel pellet inside in X-rays. The X-rays strip the surface of the pellet and trigger a rocket-like implosion, driving temperatures and pressures to extremes only seen inside stars, giant planets and nuclear detonations. The implosion reaches speeds of 400 kilometers per second and causes the deuterium and tritium to fuse. In the latest experiment, researchers pumped in 2.05 megajoules of laser energy and got about 3.15 megajoules out, a roughly 50% gain and a sign that fusion reactions in the pellet were driving further fusion reactions. The energy production took less time than it takes light to travel one inch, said Dr. Marvin Adams at the NNSA. Immense hurdles remain, however, in the quest for fusion power plants. While the pellet released more energy than the lasers put in, the calculation does not include the 300 or more megajoules needed to power up the lasers in the first place. The NIF lasers fire about once a day, but a power plant would need to heat targets 10 times per second. Then there's the cost of the targets. The ones used in the US experiment cost tens of thousands of dollars, but for a viable power plant, they would need to cost pence. Another issue is how to get the energy out as heat. Dr. Kim Budil, the director of the Lawrence Livermore National Laboratory, said with enough investment, a few, a few decades of research could put us in a position to build a power plant. In some senses, everything changes. In another, nothing changes, said Justin Walk, a professor of physics at the University of Oxford and the director of the Oxford Centre for High Energy Density Science. This result proves what most physicists always believed. Fusion in the laboratory is possible. However, the obstacles to be overcome to make anything like a commercial reactor are huge and must not be underestimated. Professor Walk also added, the latest results also show that the basic science works. The laws of physics, the laws of physics do not prevent us from achieving the goal. The problems are technical and economic. As Niels Bohr, the Nobel Prize winning atomic physicist once said, prediction is very difficult, especially when it, it is about the future. And that concludes this episode of the future. We hope you found this informative. For more of our content, please subscribe to our channel, Agile Rank Mate. If you want to get the latest updates from our channel, then hit the bell icon down below to get our latest notifications. Until the next episode, take care, stay alert, ta-ta for now.